G'day, it's your host Al here with the Retro Reboot Show Episode 3. How are you doing? You're looking great. Uh, it's been a while, it's been a couple of weeks, maybe even three weeks. Three for three. Anyway, don't let that dissuade you because I've got an absolute bumper show for you today. Loads and loads and loads and loads of great stuff. I think I've just been um, collecting, right? I've been collecting all the goods. All of a sudden, I think in the in the in the northern hemisphere, I'm in the southern hemisphere. Don't forget. So the weather is supposed to start getting better any moment now. At the moment, the weather is not 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 good out there. But apparently, the weather's going to get start to get better, which is good for me because people over in the other hemisphere, the northern hemisphere, they all start going back in their little caves and tinkering with their toys, and I get to read uh, all the things on the interwebs and start reporting about it. But all of a sudden, there's been lots of things happening on the interwebs, and I've gone and started to uh, archive all of those things so I can bring them to you here on the Retro Reboot Show. So, uh, splitting the show into two parts today, I have for you the Retro Reboots section, which is talking about all of the things that we are basically rebooting in the modern day. So taking the old retro technology, giving it a modern spin and making it new. Uh, I absolutely love that. So um, we've got, for example, a game uh, which is built using the Doom 2 engine. Uh, it's called Ashes 2063. I'll show you what that's all about. Uh, we've also got the two guys from Andromeda. Yes, those guys that made the Space Quest games. They've come back out of hiding from, I don't know, for a million years, it feels like. They finally got back together. I think they had a bit of a feud, to be honest with you. They've come back together, made a new Space Quest game. It's called Space Venture. I'll tell you more about that later on. Um, uh, there's new Amiga keyboards, uh, for example. Um, there's also a new book released on Shareware. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Uh, there's origin stories on Intel's uh, early processors. There's a whole bunch of great stuff. So stay tuned. This is the Retro Reboot Show with your host, Al. I'm so pleased to have you along. Right, so um, before I get started, do check out my uh, YouTube channel. Of course, you're on there right now. I know that. But uh, see this little button up here? It says join. Click on that button if you wish. Uh, that would be super duper off you because you can be a member of this channel and support this channel right here from YouTube just by clicking that button. And memberships are really, really cheap. You can also get me on Patreon, patreon.com slash Al's Geek Lab. And patrons, as well as YouTube, can cost from just $1 a month. Really, really cheap and you can get in all the early access videos, you can get in all the um, the, the benefits of being a YouTube member, um, suggest early content, suggest, um, suggest actual content from a channel, uh, participate on polls, all sorts of stuff. So there's lots of extra benefits to being a member of uh, my channel. So get, in, get involved in the channel and uh, also it helps me basically fund this channel. So things like the new camera, which I've just bought, uh, the new microphones, all that sort of stuff. It's really, really great. I can't thank enough all of the patrons and all of the YouTube members who have helped out with this channel so far. So thank you so much. Your names are scrolling down the screen as, uh, as I speak right now. So thank you very much, you lovely patron people, for helping donate to this channel and making it what it is to this day. Okay, now, uh, oh yes, yes, oh, talking about cameras, um, if you haven't seen my last video, I did a, I did a, um, a new video just to show off the new camera. So now I'm talking to the camera up there. I've forgotten, I've got multiple cameras on the go at the moment. I'm talking to the new shiny uh, 4K Sony camera. So mm, now you can see me warts and all um, up there in this uh, in the Sony camera up there. Um, yeah, so I should be higher def, even though I'm down still in the corner of the screen. Wonderful. Um, so um, if you haven't seen that video, check it out. Um, anyway, on with the retro reboot show. Uh, let's go to the first uh, item on the list. This is a book. Yes, I'm not talking about gadgets. I'm talking about books. Good old hardback books, although you can buy it in a Kindle version. Uh, shareware Heroes, right? So if you're off a particular age, probably from the late 80s uh, through to sort of the late 90s, I guess, 
you could remember buying software or even just getting software for free through shareware. Shareware was a fantastic way. In fact, some of the best games that you ever got was through shareware. Doom, for example, was released purely through shareware. Uh, Wolfenstein 3D, obviously, I'm being very insensitive here. Um, Commander Keen and uh, Duke Nukem and all those sorts of games, Wacky Wheels, loads of these Apogee, that all of those, all of those games, they were all um, all shareware vendors. And you used to be able to get some actually really good software. You used to be able to get, let's face it, some absolutely dreadful software uh, through shareware. But the whole point of it was that you could get, you know, the first level or the first episode or, uh, you know, the limited functionality of the software for free and share it with your friends. Copy that floppy. That was the whole idea of um, shareware. And um, up until now, they, uh, there hasn't been a book on the subject. And uh, well, now Mr. Richard Moss has authored a book um, called Shareware Heroes, The Renegades Who Redefined Gaming at the Dawn of the Internet. So there you go. Um, featuring numerous interviews with the creators and developers, Shareware Heroes is a comprehensive, meticulously researched exploration of an important and too long overlooked chapter in video game history. So I would, I would definitely agree with that. There's not many books or uh, or, or um, anything really on on uh, on published. I would say on on Shareware. So get get into that. Um, so um, it is a really important part of um, anybody who played games and even software utilities and um, applicate productivity applications from the sort of late 90s to, sorry, late 80s to late 90s. So Shareware Heroes, it's available on paperback from £12.99 and obviously on uh, Kindle for £6.99. Um, and uh, if you're needing any more information, you can check out Tantubi internet tatler.blogspot.com forward slash 2022. I'll put the link in the description. Hey, um, he has a he has a blog spot and uh, that there's some pages out of the book. You can see it's quite quite a nice little looking book. Um, so yeah, I I like the look of that one. On to the next one. Deep dives on 1980s game code. Elite Revs Aviator. Yes. Um, so if you're a big fan of the BBC Micro, which, uh, like me, um, if you grew up in the UK, uh, like me, then you probably couldn't look past the BBC Micro. I, I just love the beep. The BBC Micro and all of its variants is a great, great little uh, computer. And it had some amazing games, and one of those games was Elite. So this is on the Retro Computing Forum. If you've never been to the Retro Computing Forum, by the way, I highly recommend going on to it. It's an absolutely wonderful website, um, and there's always something uh, wonderful coming up. Anyway, this uh, gent here, Ed S, uh, popped up. So this has actually been up here for um, almost a month now. Um, it shows you that I've been collating this information for quite some time. But let's just click on um, this one here for Elite. And uh, you can see here, um, there's, a, there's websites for each of these games um, that show you in-depth details about, you know, the different versions of Elite, but you can view the, the source code, which was previously unseen, um, and uh, for all the different versions, so there's a cassette version, the disc version, the 6502 second processor version, there's the master version, the Acon Elect Electron version, the Elite A version, I don't know anything about that version, and there's all sorts of documentation as well. So um, it's quite quite awesome. So let's just click on that and you can go, yeah, you can go into uh, Get GitLab, GitHub itself and uh, view the source code. So it's, um, you know, if you really wanted to get deep down and dirty and look at all of the details of how these classic games for the BBC were actually um, built, it, you can go straight through and, uh, and read up all the details, get the context of what, what the code is all about and then view the code itself. Something that up until now, has really not been a possibility. So um, really do uh, love that, that, that these sorts of ventures are starting to take place all over the place. And this is not just for the BBC Micro. Uh, I've started to see a lot of stuff. Um, in fact, just yesterday, I saw that Duke, somebody has done the same for Duke Nukem 2. So there you go. Uh, right, now, um, 
over on Reddit on Retro Battle Stations for absolutely no reason other than I went, oh, I remember my libretto. I had one of these lovely little things. They were absolutely freaking awesome. And, you know, you can see what, what I mean. Look at it. Look at this beautiful little computer. Isn't it just the beautiful? It's just gorgeous. So I thought, I need to ask everybody what the nicest, cutest, what most wonderful little retro computer they ever had was. And um, boy, oh boy, did I get a few responses from you guys. Um, so here, uh, here's a photo from um, Andrew Stephen. Um, I think this is on Facebook. Um, Andrew, a uh, longtime fan of the channel, has um, shown a photograph of his um, Huskies. Now, these are rugged machines, and they're running um, a version of DOS. In fact, MS-DOS. Um, these are, I say rugged, if you look at them, he says that he's cleaned them up, um, but they're, <laughs> Andrew, they're, they don't look very clean to me. Let, let's just see if I can zoom in. Uh, let's, look, look at these things, look. They don't, they don't look clean. They look downright dirty. Dirty, dirty, dirty. <laughs> Dirty Andrew. Um, but he says, it's hard to choose, but these are a couple of Husky Hunter 16s. Are they, is that because they're 16 bit? I don't know. But um, a rugged handheld running MS-DOS 3.3. They have an aluminium alloy case and are very heavy, but have a pretty rough life, but still work perfectly. I've thoroughly scrubbed these to get them as clean as I can. I believe you, Andrew. I believe you. Uh, but they look really cool. And I love the um, the little, if you ha if I have a look at this, um, I keep clicking the wrong uh, zoom button. Um, if you have a look at that little paw print. Oh, look at that, the Husky Hunter. Look at the paw print button, isn't that nice? I think, I'm assuming that's like an enter button. Don't really know much about them, but they look quite similar to the uh, Atari portfolio. I had one of those, the Atari portfolio. Goodness only knows what I did with my portfolio. Should have kept on to that. Um, but they do look kind of similar. Um, would like to know more about the uh, Husky Hunter. So Andrew, if you uh, if you want to tell us more, feel free to write in on the back of self, self adest envelope to uh, Al's Geek Lab or, or just get in touch. Why not Why not uh, just uh, get in touch and leave your comments in uh, on this video? would love to hear from you a bit more. Andrew, thanks. Um, what else? What else do we have? Um, we have this one here, the Oquo. This one is interesting. This one is very interesting. Now, uh, Tilvid said, I remember really wanting one of these to run Windows XP on but the prices were insane, especially for a college student. So what uh, what actually is an oak wall? Well, it's one of these things. I mean, look at it. It looks just bizarre. I've never I've never heard of it. I've never seen it. Have you guys? Let me know in the comments if you've ever heard of an oak wall. But um, you know, the word vaporware is um, has uh, has been mentioned here. So the original Oco Model 1, or O1, was announced several years before prototypes were ever seen, leading to many people calling it vaporware until it was finally released in quarter three of 2004. The computer shipped with XP installed, home edition or professional, but the tablet PC edition was not available until the Model O1 Plus was released and featured a one gigahertz Transmeta Crusoe. I remember the Transmeta Crusoe. What was the Transmeta Crusoe in? It was in quite a few things, but I... I definitely had a device which had the Transmeta Crusoe CPU in it. Anyway, 20 gig hard drive and 256 meg of RAM. It included 1.1 USB, a Firewire 400, a headphone port, blah, 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 blah. Just a really weird looking device though. Um, like the keyboard doesn't look that all that desirable. I got I gotta say, not not uh, not gonna lie. Don't know if I would want to. <laughs> don't know if I'd want to type on that every day. Um, then there was an O1 Plus, and then an O2, and here's the E2, which looks a bit more. Oh goodness, wrong. Yeah, sorry, getting ahead of myself there. Uh, this is the E2. Uh, looks a bit more. Looks a bit more sophisticated actually, and the keyboard looks a bit more reasonable. And in fact, that keyboard there looks very reminiscent of the uh, the portfolio. Not gonna lie, that, the keys, especially these cutouts here, look just like the portfolio. That's that's kind of kind of interesting. And this trackpad here, very strange. Um, so the E two, 
came out in 2007 and announced the availability of the Model E2 with embedded HSPDA mobile broadband capability, providing customers in Europe and Asia with a widely available high-speed internet connectivity. Um, cool. And then there was a 2 Plus, and then the company went bankrupt in 2009. So there you go. So there's the specs of the Oquo. Very interesting. Never heard of the Oquo. Let us know in the comments, Tilvids, uh, if you've um, if you've got any more information on the Oquo. Uh, uh, yeah, I might not even be pronouncing it right. Um, let us know if uh, if anybody have actually if anybody's actually had an Oquo. Uh, love to hear from you again. That would be cool. Um, and then uh, Sysop or S W B B S E R uh, said that would. The device um, that they they would like to uh, reminisce about would be the GPH Canu. Canu. These are such weird devices. I mean, I've never never heard of half of these, and I thought I've heard a lot of devices. The Canu handheld console. I'm really puzzled why the price was so high on eBay and other trading auction item or platforms. It is quite underperforming, but runs Sega Genesis emulation quite well. Though I will keep it in my collection a while longer. Interesting. Yes, uh, another another device which I have not heard of. There you go. Uh, next, um, shall move on to the next. If I can uh, bring the next one up. Oh yes, it's this one. My Twitter. So I had a whole bunch of uh, tweets. Um, Signing Stan, Signing Stan Retro said the Scion Series 3. Now, ah, now the Scion Series 3 is a series of uh, portables that I know very well. And yes, personal favorite, very good devices, very well built uh, pieces of software, uh, pieces of hardware with, with great software, absolutely. Good built in software, including very capable programming language, which makes a great little 16 bit platform. And the ease of programming compa compatible comparable sorry to the eight bits. Another contender is the HP 100 LX, a capable pocket DOS machine. I have one of those. Is it the HP 100? No, it's the 95 LX. My bad. There it is. There. Um, this is an absolutely lovely device, and I really, really need to do a video on it. Um, and it's even got batteries in it. So that, that means I could probably even just turn it on. But it is a DOS device. Um, yeah, <laughs> the batteries are dead. Go figure. DOS device, uh, I think it's running DOS 3 of some description, MS-DOS nonetheless. And it's got built-in Lotus 1, 2, 3. It's a really, really good device. Runs off two AA batteries. Really, really good device. So it's, I think the HP 100 LX that you're mentioning there is a uh, is, is is an upgraded version of this. So it was like a more beefy version of this, had a better screen and whatnot. But it started with this, the 95 LX. So there's a video coming up very soon with my new camera. All the things I can do now with this nice new camera, it's just great. And then Geek with Social Skills, GWS Rocks on Twitter says, I always wanted a Toshiba libretto back in the day. Never got one, sadly. Mm, sad face. I had uh, a libretto. I had two librettos. I had that one that you saw there. Um, and then I had a longer, like a, almost a laptop. Uh, it was really thin. And then I went on to a Portage. All three of those laptops absolutely stunning laptops really really nice uh although well, you couldn't call them laptops really they were just really portable ultra portable things but they were they were really really great machines and then you know now look at what toshiba are putting out it's just garbage really sorry toshiba but it's true um anyway never got one sadly i did have a few of the chunky toshiba satellite machines they were also good uh, but they were chunky. Yes, they were. In present day, I'd love to get a Toshiba libretto. Not willing to pay the IMHO <laughs> high eBay prices on them. Yes, I'm sure they are very. I haven't even looked. Um, I'm sure they're very expensive. Um, now, uh, I don't really know if this uh, goes into the in the category of uh, the little retro machine, the coolest little. The, the word little was the operative word there, Jonathan. Uh, but it's still a cool 
uh, machine and it is small ish but it's you know it's not something that you can take with you but i do i do think that this device is really cool if you haven't seen one of these before uh, do look them up the 1984 hp 150 touchscreen with an integrated thermal printer yes it's, it's, you can see up the back there they've got, they've got a printer i've got a device that's kind of similar it is a, a luggable um it's a port it's called a it's actually just down here in the corner just off screen it's a, a panasonic senior partner i think it's called and it's got a thermal printer built into the back of it so it's about this wide and yay high the whole thing monitor crt monitor keyboard the whole thing built in but this is a sort of more classic desktop looking case with a touch screen from 1984 it's it's pretty cool uh a really nice looking machine as well but um there you go that's 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 a nice machine yep um Ian Kendall says he coveted a libretto, but it was way outside his budget. I have very warm feelings for the Atari portfolio. Yes, as mentioned, yes. And later the Cyan 5, the port came with me backpacking. Port? The port? As I guess he means in the portfolio. Uh, with backpacking in Australia until I got an Olivetti Quadrerno, which I have no idea what a Quadrerno is. What's the Quadrerno? Never seen one of these before. Hey. Hey, they, they look kind of cool. Hey, I've got no idea what's going on in the screen there, but that's that's kind of interesting. I kind of like that. Anybody got any experience a bit more with the Quadrerno? Let me know in the comments. Would like to know more. What are they? Are they DOS machines? Are they they kind of look DOSy? Um, what sort of um, processing power did they have? What what did they do? What did they do? Did they have built-in software? They look nice. Much computing. Oh. Lovely. Big chunky keys. Lovely. Yeah, okay. Uh, the some thumbstick on the right side of the screen was impossible to use. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming we're talking about the libretto there. I don't agree with that, Damien. I actually found the thumbsticks A-OK. -okay. Um, wasn't a problem for the stuff that I was using it for. I was using it in, um, in uni, I think. The Sir Clive Sinclair ZX81 have one of them up there as well. I guess you could call that a cool little computer. They're pretty... Pretty portable. <laughs> uh, they didn't do very much though, but certainly pretty portable. In fact, look at how well that fits. <laughs> um, Sony had a lot of neat small laptops in the 90s. They did actually, they did. Um, that's um, Baker Technology Services. Uh, Kendall Whitehouse says, what the Atari 800XL and why Star Raiders? Um, I have got to say that Star Raiders is one of the all-time most amazing uh, games ever. I love Star Raiders. Um, but the XL, I like the look of the 800, not the XL. The XL was too late 80s brown for me and it was sort of too sleek with the big chunky keys and the heaviness the sort of late 70s look of the 800 now you're talking um but functionally the same i guess um alan cox good name by the way <laughs> etched pixels says i always preferred the pc 110 to the libretto was a nicer shape and had some classy design what was the pc 110 uh, was that a toshiba Oh, one of those ones, yes. Yes. A normal one. A normal luggable. And the Cyan MX5. Uh, yes, great, great, uh, great little handheld thingies. Or the 5MX. Yes, 5MX. Uh, that's what I, I thought you meant. Yep. Cool. Excellent. So thank you so much for sending in all your suggestions. Some really great uh, little devices there. If you've got any little devices that you think beats all of those devices hands down way 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 better it just like completely shmozzle sh sh all of those devices then uh then tell me tell me and tell me why tell me why it's most important that you tell me why um tell me because it was they had the the, the integrated software tell me it was because they had this crazy 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 operating system on it tell me it was because they had uh um, this 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 weird um, port on the side that made it turn into you know a, a, a transformer, <laughs> a robot in disguise. I don't know. Whatever whatever it did, um, 
I'd love to know um, and why, why it did it for you. So uh, leave that in the comments. I would love to know. Love, love, love to know. Next um, is this thing up here. Actually, I've got another. I've got. A, I've got a closer, um, got a closer screenshot of this as well. Now, this is on Instagram and Dave Just Dave. Um, if you haven't caught Dave Just J, Dave, it's really difficult to say that. Dave Just Dave, his retro channel on YouTube. Check it out. Really good channel. Really good channel. Anyway, he posted this a um, while back, about three weeks ago. And everybody kind of got in on the on the old Palooza off um, comments. Control Alt Reese got in there, and then I got in there, and then a whole bunch of other people did too. And it's this thing called the Turbo Switch by the Megahertz Com Corporation. What a what a name for a company, the Megahertz Corporation. And um, and I was thinking, you know, what is this thing? What is this thing? It starts off with a question. Questions the audience. What's the difference, right? Um, you have got the speed, right? Okay, PS2 model 50. So that was what a you know an AT that ran at eight megahertz or something. I don't know, but whatever the PS2 speed was, it, it did it did these calculations at you know eight point nine seconds for doing this, and it cost you if you bought an a, a PS2 model 50, it cost you three and a half thousand dollars in whatever year this advert advert was from. But if you bought a normal PCAT, or if you had one just kicking around the house at this, whatever year this was, and you bought one of these 80 turbo switches from Megahertz Corporation, if you bought one of those for a measly 125 bucks, uh, you'd save yourself 3,500 bucks and you'd get one of these things for, 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 the, for the pleasure of it. Now, sounds too good to be true. And that's what we are probably all saying uh, on the on the comments on them on Instagram here after um, Dave just Dave popped it up. But we also started off our comments. Our comments were starting off pretty naive. They were like, "Oh, we want one. We want one." So first of all, had any of you guys watching or girls, of course, watching this video, have you ever seen one of these in real life? And if so, how did it work? And I've, I've got similar things. I've got a, an Orchid card um, called a Tiny Turbo, which turns an XT into, well, an AT, I guess. It's got a, it's got a 286 board. Um, so, so it sits in a, an ISA slot, and it's got a 286 CPU on it, and you plug your, your, uh, your, X, your 8088 onto the card as well, and you plug the, a ribbon cable goes from the card itself onto the socket for your 8088 onto the motherboard. That's the way it works, right? This thing here is a bit of an anomaly. You can't see around the back of it, but it just looks like a printed circuit board um, with a few chips maybe soldered to the back of it and then this blanking plate and then what looks to be like some sort of Molex power connector here. You know, it looks like it plugs power, like it almost looks like the mainboard power connector. I don't know, really weird, really weird. And it's just got a, 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 a switch here that switches between uh, turbo and the standard AT speed, which was six megahertz, right? So if you bought an IBM uh, PCAT, which is, the, I guess, the target market was, it would be dropping you back to your standard AT, which was six megahertz, right? But if you switched it into turbo mode, like, you know, Michael Knight, um, you could choose from any of the speeds. Uh, so obviously some sort of oscillator control there. You could choose from 8, 9, 10, 11 megahertz. And there was even a little reset switch as well to reset the machine if it crashed. So how the heck did this machine work? You know, so you didn't have to upgrade to, the whole point was that you didn't have to buy a PS2, which was probably a 286 with um, with 12 megahertz, 286 or something like that. You could, you could just pop this in your machine and you would get. But there's no place by the looks of it for a CPU on this. So what is it doing? Is it, is it just overclocking your machine? Is it just changing the oscillator? It doesn't, it really, really irks me. And um, there's a lot of people <laughs> sort of saying the same thing too. But uh, I found that a really interesting little hack. And I'm sure it is a hack, but I'm sure that's something not quite right in that uh, in there. So if you know what what's going on there, uh, I'd love to hear from you. Pop your 
comments below. Uh, all right, on to the next thing. Oh, yes, the chip letter. This is a really good uh, article. I thought this was, um, this is great. This is a great article. Um, so I'm not obviously going to read it out to you, but uh, if you go to the chipletter.substack.com, and again, I'll obviously pop all the links in the description. Um, this is um, this is a really nice uh, sort of expose on a bit, bit of the truth behind the inventor of the silicon chip and why he deserves a bit more credit for the microprocessor. And there's Robert Noyce or Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore in front of the Intel SE1 building in Santa Clara in 1970. So really good um, backstory and, and story of the Intel 4004 uh, CPU. And um, if you didn't know, it was basically built, um, I guess, for, for a calculator. Um, and in, Intel didn't really understand what they were building microprocessors for in, back in that day. And uh, so this this is a this is not a long read as you can see, um, and then it finishes it off with a link to the thirty fifth anniversary um, computer history museum uh, YouTube video as well. So really good uh, article. Um, it took me probably five minutes to read the article, maybe less. So not a long read. Definitely worth a read uh, if you've got five minutes spare. So yeah, that's a good one to to read over. Yay. Okay, on with the next. Oh yes, in the similar vein, uh, see, I'm just segueing so well <laughs> this time. The world's first microcomputer. Now, um, a lot of people would have said if they if they thought about the world's first microcomputer, they would go, yeah, MITS, the Altair 8008, right? They would go something like that. You know, they would go, right, the thing, or, or like they might they might skip a machine, they might go the MSI 8080. But generally speaking, you know, people are people are around that sort of 1975, the picture on the front of popular electronics. That's what people think of when they when they think of the uh that thing, right? That's what they think of when they think of the first microcomputer. They think of this thing. But you'd be wrong. <laughs> this is the first microcomputer, apparently. Question mark. Um, and bearing in mind the microcomputer must use a microprocessor, right? So just like we're talking about there with the 4004 processor, right? That was a very underpowered processor. This one didn't use the uh, 4004, so don't worry about that but it mustn't use the discrete logic chips, the TTL chips. It needs to use a proper microprocessor. This thing here, the Q1, predates the Altair. And look at it. It's got this lovely case, a full keyboard. It's much more sophisticated looking than the, uh, than the, 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 the Altair. And, and this thing here, the screen, is actually a uh, plasma display by the looks of it so that's a uh, uh you know a video you can you can go through the guy that's it's going to be a two-part video um the guy's name is the bite attic um but he sort of tears down the machine um and has a good look at it so it's not a, an original version it's not the first uh revision of the q1 but it gives you an idea of the technologies used in this very first microcomputer. So that's a, a thing that really f threw me because I thought, oh, I know what the first computer, the microcomputer was. It's the it's the Altair, right? No, wrong, apparently. So there you go. <laughs> you learn something new every single day. And anyway, that wraps up our retro stuff for this episode of the Retro Reboot Show. Now on with the Retro Reboots. The first thing in the retro reboots is, of course, this AppleSoft Basic ep Editor. Now, if um, and of course, and the uh, the the Merlin Assembler as well. So basically, um, if you are aware of what WebAssembly is, um, and I'm going to butcher this here, WebAssembly is basically like the ability to build fully assembled binaries in the web browser. Um, so this this is basically like taking yeah fully fully um, 
fully streamed application. Just imagine if ActiveX was a secure and good thing. Remember ActiveX? And remember how horrible it was? Right. <laughs> imagine that, but just imagine it for a secure environment. You might be somewhere close. I think that's kind of the gist with WebAssembly. Don't shoot me if I'm completely wrong, but that's the gist of what I get with WebAssembly. Anyway, this, this here, the Merlin Assembler and the uh, AppleSoft Basic Editor has been built from scratch within the, um, within the WebAssembly technology. Okay, so if I wanna do this, I can type it over here, which is a lot easier than typing it in the actual sort of VM, I guess. And I can go in and, you know, change things to my heart content. So it's just like, I'm actually writing, you know, in the browser, I can upload and download text files to my heart's content. So I don't have to fiddle around with things. Um, so I could imagine I can upload it in our basic file uh, right here in the browser or download from this uh, environment as well. So I can do that easily, that's no problem. But I'm just gonna type in um, a little basic program and see if it works. Hello from Al's Geek Lab. Uh, very go to 20, let's see. Now, if I update that, I think that might be the button that I need to press and then run. Hey, there we go. <laughs> um, so that's, yeah, basically that's how it's simple it is. And you can go through different um, different programs in memory just by clicking on this thing here as well. Um, I don't know what these things do. So that's very cool. Um, yeah, same with the assembler as well. You can uh, look at, uh, di do different source code. You can compile the source code and so forth. So I can assemble that and then execute that there and then run the assembled source code right in that virtual machine. And of course I can take that now and then put it on a real Apple II if I wanted to. So that's glorious that you can do that in this modern day, real retro rebooting. Okay, the next thing. This here is called Ashes 2063. Now, this is um, the gameplay of the game. Have a look at this, have a look at the graphics. Looks almost, I would say, Duke Nukem-like, but it's built on the Doom 2, uh, Doom 2 engine. And you can actually download this as a standalone. You don't need the Doom 2 wads, because all the textures are all um, completely standalone. I'll just skip ahead. Here's some, here's some flesh-eating baddies. So yeah, that's it running on the GZ Doom engine, obviously. Ah, here, here it is in English. The gameplay of Ashes 2063, a TC mod for Doom 2 made with the GZ Doom engine. Or what started out as such, since it's practically an independent game, which has placed us in a post-apocalyptic -apoc world, excellently set and well designed, a mod that you have to play if you like classic FPSs and this kind of setting. It currently consists of two episodes plus an expansion of the first and can be downloaded in standalone version. That is, you can play it and you don't need anything else. Uh, so that's the link to it. It's on Mod DB if you want to get it. There it is, right there. So I'll post that link in the description. Looks very, very, very playable. Um, like the look of that an awful lot. Ashes 2063. Now, this is a biggie. This is a biggie. I'm gonna run the trailer. Oh yeah.
And yes, it says available now. So Ron Gilbert, the guy who originally made Monkey Island, has done it. He's finally got back and made the game return to Monkey Island. I can't believe it. So, you know, I played Monkey Island um, in 1990, 91, something like that. And it was one of my all-time favorite games. I loved the humor. The, it, it wasn't just the game's gameplay, uh, the fact that you couldn't die, which was a revelation compared to the Sierra games that I was playing at the game. It was the graphics. It was the story. It was the humor. It was all of those things intertwined um, that really set that game apart. It was a great, great adventure game. And it's certainly, to this day, Monkey Island is one of my all-time favorite games. Not not just favorite games of the adventure game genre, favorite games, right? Um, so this is really, really exciting. It's on Steam. And then I thought, um, I thought, whoa, well, you know, what if I don't like it? Uh, I headed over to Steam. I haven't bought it yet. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit nervous, actually. Um, I really, <laughs> that's a bit dumb of me to say. Um, I should really not be nervous to buy a game. But I'm like, what if I don't like it? But uh, fortunately, uh, the reviews so far, um, bear in mind that this is, you know, just out. This is like September 20th it came out. Um, so what's that? Like, yeah, just 10 days old. Um it's got extremely good reviews. So IGN, The Gamer, and Games Radar, all 9 out of 10. Um, if you play adventure games, or if you've played adventure games, um, you've probably played Monkey Island already. Uh, but if you ever played Monkey Island, if you have... Uh, if you have... A, a fa if you're a fan of adventure games, then really, I think you probably owe it to yourself to play... The return to Monkey Island. Um, the the story the story set up that, um, that Stan uh, here uh, should just remind you who Stan is. Stan is the guy in the first game that you buy the boat from. The used uh, he's he runs the used boatyard, um, and um, and he's in jail. So that's part of the story. Um, so. <laughs> you can actually say it uh, to you can speak to Stan from from the uh, the website. Um, they say they're calling it marketing crimes. <laughs> so there you go. So yeah, a lot of the original characters uh, from the the original games, the first two games, are back for this game. So look, it's got it's got the blessing of Lucasfilm games. It's got. You know, it's it's got all the original people in it. It's got original characters in it. Um, what more can I say? Yeah, it's 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 Monkey Island. So you got to go and play it. That it's as simple as that. So very exciting, very very exciting to have Monkey Island return to our computers and the Nintendo Switch. <clears throat> you can grab it over there. All right, now on to the next one, which is the Two Guys Space Venture by the creators of Space Quest. So if you remember the two guys from Andromeda, do you remember the two guys from Andromeda? Hopefully you do. Um, those were the guys who made Space Quest 1 through Space Quest, how many? How many Space Quests were there? Space Quest 7? I think, I don't know. There was a few. Anyway, uh, on the 17th of September, the two guys from Andromeda did release an update. And this is, I think they started this project as far back as up to 10 years ago. So this is a really, really long time coming. Um, but they announced um, that they uh, were finally uh, able to release the first platformed version. I don't know what the first platformed version means. Was it wearing stilettos? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, before, before I get started here, it's very important that if you haven't already read the last update, you do not know. Lots of questions, blah, 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 blah. But basically, um, the people who paid for the Kickstarter version of the uh, Space Venture game they have got the game already and i think the you know the game will be available um you know for further release later on down the line but basically if you've paid for your kickstarter release so from 15 dollars and up 
then you'll be able to download um, the, the game or have already downloaded the game. So if you have a copy of the game and um, are willing to tell us what the game's all about, I have no idea. Don't I? I know there's probably a number of you watching the video going, why did you not put a kickstart into this game, Alistair? Uh, that's a very, very good question. I have absolutely no idea why I did not, donate, did not donate a measly 15 bucks towards uh, a game series which is like part of my a big part of my childhood i've got no idea don't ask me not sure sorry about that two guys um very strange indeed but anyway it's great to see that um it did as i say it started a very very long time ago uh, well look look there 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 you go an estimated delivery time of february 2013 so I'm, I'm pretty sure it was 2012. So, uh, I mean, heck, I might have even pledged 15 bucks back in 2012. And if I did, then who knows if I was even using the same email address back in 2012. So that'll be fun. Uh, <laughs> uh, I might. Um, so anyway, that's great to hear. If you have uh, installed your copy of um, the, the Space Venture, I would love to know what you think of it if it's a great game and uh, yeah get in touch maybe we could um i don't know we, we could do a video link up we could uh, we could do a little bit of a, a playoff see if the game's good fun that'd be great um here's a bit of a video which is seven minutes long i won't play it long oh the space quest logo Three, love it. Sludge, space space four. Andromeda. Yeah, so I think um, I think the two guys had a bit of a fallout. You know what would be a good idea? Is to see if I could get an interview with the two guys. And uh, I'd, I'd probably ask them candid questions. Hey gang, Scott and Mark here. The original. There they are. I'd probably ask, I'd probably start asking them awkward questions though that they probably wouldn't want to answer. So. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, right, okay, next up is the uh, the Amiga-branded USB keyboard Kickstarter. Very quick one, this one. Uh, a long overdue keyboard updated. So there's another Kickstarter that's been around for quite some time and nothing much had happened. In fact, I think that they had originally, uh, they had a big goal um, of... Um, think uh, $378,000 New Zealand that is. So, I mean, 300,000 US or something like that. And um, I think the, the pledge that they received off um, was was like something like a tenth of that. But basically, the, the idea with these guys was that they wanted to make retro keyboards of all different shapes and sizes that, that emulated their, uh, their, their their childhood keyboards. Um, they're just normal USB keyboards. They look the same. They, they, they work with a normal PC or Mac, but obviously look the same as the original uh, computers that they, they, they came from back in the day. And it looks like, I say looks like, uh, at the end of the month in September there, um, the Amiga keyboards are actually shipping. And this is what the Amiga keyboards look like, if um, this ever loads for some reason it's taking a long time. But yeah, there you go. There's the uh, um, USB mechanical. So it's, it's like cherry keys it's got. Look at my mouse cursor has changed. Oh, isn't that cool? Uh, yeah, they look, they look kind of fabby actually. Um, nice little Amiga 
icon up the top right there and the Amiga keys on the keyboard where the Windows key should be, of course. So, um, yeah, if you're an Amiga fan, uh, it's £120. That's expensive, but not necessarily that expensive for a Cherry, uh, Brown Cherry MX key switch. So, yeah, that's, um, that's pretty good. So, simulant.uk are doing those. Um, and I think obviously you can get other types of um, keyboards and stuff from them as well. Anyway, totally not endorsing them whatsoever. I just saw that and I thought that looks cool. Uh, and then moving right along in our retro reboot, another thing which looks really cool, 64 or C64 OS, an operating system for your original Commodore 64. Um, now, if you watch Perry uh videos, then you've probably seen this already. He reviewed this or pre he reviewed a pre-release version of this a uh, couple of weeks back. Absolutely just freaking crazy. This is just mental. An operating system, a GUI operating system at that, pretty much a GUI. It's a TUI um, to be precise. But, um, you know, <laughs> this is just, uh, it's just, just brilliant. Um, I think this is awesome that, um, you know, a fully featured, pretty much, uh, graphical user interface for Commodore 64. Like, look at this, this is the file manager here. Uh, you know, that, that is actually, the whole purpose of the, the operating system here is, is actually a feature-rich and functional operating system, rather than just something which is a bit, you know, looks fancy or anything like that. So. Okay, so the C64 has many operating systems written for it, so why do you need another? Some of these projects were designed to be experimental, yes. So even I would say GEOS, to an extent, was probably experimental, or to demonstrate a point rather than to solve a problem or make using the C64 better. Others had good intentions, but pushed the machine, and it is only a one megahertz machine, bear in mind, in ways that it wasn't designed for, compromising on speed and usability in the pursuit of features available on more powerful computers. C64 OS works with the limitations of the Commodore 64 and embraces them and gives you your computer an all new set of sophisticated tools that empower you to be productive with your C64 to be useful. So that is, uh, that's quite the coolest thing. I just love the fact that we're doing this sort of stuff in the modern day, 2022, we're making uh, you know an operating system for Commodore 64. There's a little memory map application as well. Um, so yeah, uh, really cool. Um, you can. This is a boxed product. You can buy it. It has a shiny manual. It's it's the real deal. Uh, and you can go over to um, this website, which is c64os.com, and order it online. And I think the, what, how much does it cost? 59 Canadian dollars. Um, already out of stock. <laughs> um, funny that, there's a lot of nerds out there who like it. If you want a review, then you want to pop over to Perry Fractic's video, as I say. Um, you might look at the, all of this and say, well, it's no different to what Geos does. With there you go. Stuff. Drag and drop uh, windows. And Geos playing music while you're moving a window around full screen. So that's another benefit of this text mode here. Wait. So he's um, yeah, he's doing a little comparison there of Geos and um, and uh, this this OS. Um, I, I do love uh, Perry Fractic's, um nice sort of. I think I think he is trying to be Michael Knight now. He's got he's gone full tilt with his um, his Tesla, and he's just he's embodied the whole um, the whole uh, the whole outfit. Basically, now he's now he's going with these glasses, these 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 yellow porn star eighties glasses. Yeah, good on you, uh, Perry Fractic. That's awesome. All right, um, on with the next one. Yes, uh, this one I think was um, featured by Lunduk. It was featured by Lunduk. That's who it was. Um, it's 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 wild. Um, another retro reboot, basically. An, an Apple II desktop, um, basically running in a modern desktop. It's a Finder-like GUI application. Uh, it will run on any Apple II with 128K, so you need a bit extra memory, of course. Uh, uses the double high-res graphics, uh, uses a mouse optionally, though, um, and it needs ProDOS 8. 
Um, so yeah, it's a proper, it looks like kind of, um, you remember um, GSOS, you know, the, the graphical operating system for the Apple II GS. Uh, it looks kind of like that, but it's wicked cool to see something um, along those lines on, you know, the 8-bit um, Apple II desktop. And this is um, this is a video of an earlier uh, release of it. Um, I, think, I think you can see it here just ever so slightly, not very well, um, but you can see it in, in operation here. Um, there's probably some better videos on YouTube, but um, there you go. There you can see it uh, operating there back in 2018. Um, so yeah, if you want to be able to run a GUI operating system on an 8-bit Apple II, that's how you do it. You run this uh, desktop widgets for Apple II. It's um, available on GitHub for download on A2 stuff. I'll pop all of these links, of course, in the description. Moving on then, Exodus, right. Exodus, what is Exodus first and foremost? That's the most important question that you have. If you know what Exodus is, you'll just, just wanna skip ahead because um, I'll give you a link at the end of this Exodus bit that you might be interested in. Um, if you have never heard of Exodus and you like playing MS-DOS games, then whoa, you're in for a treat. I have known about Exodus for a while, but I've never mentioned it on this particular show. So here we go. Exodus is basically an, a massive amalgamation of thousands and thousands and thousands of um, DOS games, like all of them, basically. I mean, it's not all of them, but it's pretty darn close to all of them. I mean, when I say all of them, I mean, have a look at this list. I'm still going. Yeah, I'm still going. And some of these are small, some of these are, are large. You can see like Harvester, I, I, can't, I don't know what Harvester was, but that's a gig in size. Some, some of them are small, Hardline, 97 you know so these are you know it's not just the original old dos games from 1981 1982 these are right the way up to the very very end of uh, dos and i think it's probably some 3.x games as well the, the pack so they're all released in packs and obviously we're up to exodos 5 now the pack includes 7200 dos games um and they're all pretty much english games so not only have they been categorized properly, all of the games have metadata for them, so such as cover art, um, proper information like instructions and so forth. Um, so they're all um, really, really well looked after. Um, the focus on the games that were either released in English or fairly easy to play without a knowledge of the native language. This is not every DOS game ever made, however, it is a very high percentage of all commercial releases there are thousands of freeware, homebrew, and shareware games that will continue to be added in future packs. So, um, so there's all of this. You can re you can download uh, Exodos um, as a torrent, um, or you can get the light release as a torrent. Now, you might be asking, what is the light release, uh, and what's the full release? Well, the full release is all those games which is gazillions of them, and bearing in mind that some of them are gigs in size, right? And then the light release is only 52 gigs in size. So this is not for the, the lighthearted. I mean, this is, this is a big download, even if it's the light release. And the light release does not include any games. It is 52 gigs, includes the metadata, only the metadata, and the front end. So it's got a nice GUI front end that you can click uh, the game that you want and it'll download the game for you and it will show you up. So that's a really cool, um, cool, uh, nice little front end and it has all of the information, as I say, the meta information and all the rest. Uh, you can even purchase a uh, physical box, I think, as well. Um, so there you go, that's Exodus. Now I'll also produce a link to a mirror of all of those games that are in Exodus 5 in uh, the uh, description. Hopefully that's okay. Hopefully I'm not doing anything wrong. I think it's a mirror. So there's the an FTP style link. It's uh, over HTTPS. But there's a link to all of the games inside Exodus 5 
for your downloading pleasure. So if you wanted to download a game, one game at a time, just via that, you could do so just there. I believe Exodus is available for uh, Windows, Linux, and also Mac, it runs over DOSBox. So that is awful, awfully cool. Right, and the last thing I think I have for you in this very big bumper edition of Al's Geek Labs Retro Reboot Show is this, it's Turbo Vision. Turbo Vision, if you remember uh, the Turbo Pascal and Turbo C and Turbo C++ of Borland back in the day, you might, you might be uh, happy with this. This is Turbo Vision. Um, and uh, this is this um, this person here, Maggie Blot, um, has started a personal project back in the very end of 2018. And by May 2020, considered it was very close to feature parity with the original Turbo Vision, decided to make it open. Um, so this product works with Linux as well as uh, DOS and Windows. Um, it is Unicode, I believe. So basically it takes that original coding environment that you used to know and love from the days of um, uh, MS-DOS, I guess, and the Borland environment, and then turned it into a, I guess, a compatible environment for developers in, um, in, in, in the modern world. So yay. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And that was also uh, it was also brought to me by the Mr. Uh, wonderful Mr. Uh, Brian Lunduk. So thank you very much. Much props for um, for that one, Brian. That is my last uh, retro reboot topic for the day. Uh, if you have anything you would like to share and um, uh, bring up with the Retro Reboot Show, then please put in the comments below. I would love to hear from you as always. Um, and of course, any other comment just in general, just in general, just love to hear from you. That's what makes this show great is the interaction. I think that's the whole point of this. The interaction is really the um, the fun part of it. It's um, it's much more, it's much better when there's two, you know, or, or three or four. You know? It's much better when there's more than one, you know. Don't like, don't like it when it's just me, you know. Hmm. Uh, anyway, um, where was I going with that? Oh, anyway, thanks very much for watching. If you would like to support this show, help out with things like this shiny new camera, uh, the, the microphone, this microphone, that camera. Um, if you would like to uh, participate in the overall show stuff, if you would like to make suggestions for show content, the best way to do all of that stuff is to become a patron or to join the channel here on YouTube. Press the join button on YouTube or head over to Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Al's Geek Lab. If you want to, you can donate from just $1 a month, not very expensive, and you get lots of kudos for doing so. You get your name up in lights uh, in every single one of my videos, and you get a lot of good, shiny, happy feelings for doing so. So yeah, I would love to uh, love to welcome you to part of the community. Anything else? I think that's it for this episode. Thank you very much for watching. Stay tuned. Until next time, uh, be excellent to each other.